Everybody ready for the word today? Come on, you can do better than that. It's been about three weeks since we've been back in the building, and I'm grateful for you showing up today. If you're watching online, I would love for you to come on out at about 12 o'clock. We'll be in the parking lot and, and just enjoying one another. And so I want to encourage everybody, if you have your Bible, if you can go to Ephesians chapter 5. I have 20 verses to get through, and I got five minutes. Ephesians chapter 5. And when you get it, say word, for it's the word of God that changes hearts. Ephesians chapter 5. We're in part 12. Can you believe that? Part 12 of our series. If you're new here, we've been going through the book of Ephesians. The Apostle Paul, he's writing this letter to this church, and he's trying to mature them in the faith. And so we've been going through this book line by line, precept by precept, to see what God has to say to our church. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that's going to go forth. Lord, I pray that you can speak a word that can change our hearts. We're not here to hear a motivational speech. But we're here to, to listen, to hear the very oracles of God. As the grass withers and the flower may fade, it is your word that stands forever. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a deep theological question for everyone in this room right off the jump. Does anybody remember CDs? CDs, compact discs. Uh, I, I love CDs. I still use CDs from time to time. I got a new truck about three months ago, and, and I took my CD and I tried to put it in the truck, and there was something that I noticed. There was no CD player. So CDs have became the new A-tracks. I mean, I was searching for it. I, I said, maybe it's in the glove box, or maybe it's in the back seat. I, I want my CDs, and but it wasn't there. But CDs, young people, are compact discs. It's a replica, but it's not the real thing. It's a copy of the real thing. There's something called a master that's the real thing, but in order for everyone to hear that master version, a copy needs to be made. A copy sounds just like the master, but it is not the master. Jesus is our master. And Jesus is looking for us to be copies. He's looking for us to talk like him, to walk like him, to think like him. And the Bible clearly states that we're supposed to have the mind of Christ. Every thought should be the same way that Jesus thought. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, if you don't know who Christ is, just follow my life and I'll show you who Christ is. Can we say that on our job? Can we say that in our families? I don't know who Jesus is. Just walk with me for a month. You discover who he is. We are supposed to replicate and be a copy of the master. And in our text today in Ephesians chapter 5, we're learning about what it is to be a copy unto the Lord, what it is to replicate him. Being a Christian means to be Christ-like. Being a disciple means to learn from God. The question is, what are we learning and so Paul writes this letter to the church to mature them, and he gets to the point in Ephesians chapter 5 where he says, you know what, you need to be imitators of God. But sometimes we can be intimidated on being intimidators. We can be intimidated on following Jesus, but in Ephesians chapter 5, the question becomes, how do we imitate God? And it says in verse 1, it says, therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children. He says, now that you have new clothes and the old clothes are off you, now that you're living this resurrected life, our job, our responsibility is to be an imitator of God. It's to do what God does. As a child, or excuse me, as a parent, our children, they follow us. I don't know about you, but maybe your child, he, he tries to dress like you. He tries to talk like you. If you put on your cap and you turn it backwards, what does your child do? He turns the cap backwards. It's the same way with our walk. When we see Jesus in our lives, we're supposed to change things around so we look like our Father. But the key means this. It says, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. See, if you don't know how much God loves you, you will never imitate him. And I need to park right here because God loves you. He doesn't love you because you're in church today. 
He doesn't love you because you read your Bible last week. He loves you because he made a decision before eternity to love you in spite of you. The Bible says while we were sinners, Christ died for us. See, I love that verse right there. It didn't say when Ken came to church, then Jesus died for me because I had good works. Jesus made the decision before eternity, before every mistake that I ever made, to die for me while I was in a mess. But if we don't understand that God loves us, why would we want to imitate him? Why would we want to be a copy of him? But it says we must be imitators of God. Alexander the Great, when he saw someone in the army and had the same name as him, the first thing he would ask people who was over the army, he would say, is the person a coward? And he would walk to that person and say, listen, you need to get rid of your cowardness or you need to change your name. In other words, if you got the same name as me, you got to stop being a coward and you need to act like your name is Alexander. And what I'm telling you today, if we're going to act like we serve the name of Jesus, there's a certain way that we need to walk and talk and speak to other people. And what Jesus is saying in our scripture today, in Ephesians chapter 5, he's saying, I want you to copy me. I want you to be a copycat. Everywhere that you go, I want you to replicate who I am. I want you to be exactly like me in your thoughts, in your deeds, in your actions. And we try to be just like everybody else instead of Jesus. We put idols in our life. If I can just be this or just be that. Well, God has given us the blueprint in his Bible, the way we're supposed to imitate him. So today I want to give three ways on how we can imitate him. Here, here's the first way. If you want to imitate God, you got to walk in love. You got to walk in love. Verse 2 says this, and walk in love. Man, that's so deep. <laughs> As Christ also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. See, in the Old Testament, when, when someone sinned, the priest would have to make a sacrifice, and it had to be perfect. When we get to Jesus, we discover that he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He was the perfect sacrifice. In other words, there's nothing that you could do to pay your sin debt, but Jesus took it all on the cross. But now what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be a sacrifice. Romans 12, chapter, uh, verse 2 says this. It says, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present yourselves as a living sacrifice. See, there's a difference between a dead sacrifice and a living sacrifice. See, a dead sacrifice will never get off the altar, but a living sacrifice can make a decision to get off the altar. And some of us, listen to me, you sacrifice for a season, but yet when things got tight, so you were a living sacrifice, you walked off and strayed from the Lord. But he's saying, listen, you need to walk in love. And the greatest way you can walk in love is not by quoting scripture. The greatest way you walk in love is not by giving an offering. The greatest way to look like Jesus is serving other people. Because that's what, I knew it was going to be quiet right there. Because that's what Jesus does. The Bible says in, in Mark 10, 45, I did not come to be served. I came to serve. The king of glory stripped himself, came down to earth and said what? No, I'm not here for you to serve me. I'm here to serve you. You remember in John chapter 13 when the disciples should have been serving him, but yet Jesus, what did he do? He didn't care about titles. He cared about towels, and he washed the feet of his disciples. The greatest thing that you can do on your job in your family is serve other people. <laughs> the greatest thing you can do and say is, how can I serve you today? How, how can I bless you today? I want you to think about that. Jesus, every day, asks this question. Hey, hey, Ken, how can I bless you today? How can, I, how can I give you joy today? God cares about where you're at. God cares about how you feel. We are called to live a life worthy unto him and be a living sacrifice in everything that we do. You are more like Jesus when you serve others. That's why today, even after this service, we have every single week, we have growth track. What is that about? It's about you getting in position, discovering your purpose, so you can serve other people. And oftentimes, we think we have to get our lives together to serve other people. But have you ever discovered that when people say, I'm going to wait till I get my life together, they never get their life together? 
It is when you sacrifice your own self, even with your issues and problems, and you serve another person, that someone comes along and serves you. And oftentimes we wait and we do everything else, but when it comes to serving God, we put that last. But the greatest thing you and I can do to imitate God is to walk in love. Notice what it says. It does not say sprint in love. It says walk in love. Because sprinting means you do it for a short period of time. But what God is looking for, believers in this church and online right now, who will be consistent in their love walk, consistent in their faith. God is not looking for you to sprint and serve him for one month. There's something about consistency. This, this morning I got up and uh, I saw this older gentleman. He was jogging. And I remember five years ago when I saw him jogging, he was going slowed in a mug. I'm like, this guy is slow. He might as well even walk. Well, five years later, every single day on my way to church, this guy is still doing his thing. Now, me, when I try to sprint, I look good for two weeks. Then what happens? I end up getting hurt and injured, and now I'm no longer walking or sprinting in love. And some of us, because you wanted to quit Christianity, you got hurt and injured. And because of that, you're no longer walking in love. And I said to myself, that's a guy I want to spend about 30 minutes with because he's consistent. Every single day, he's run consistent. Even when it's winter time, he's consistent. Because it's not about speed, it's about consistently. The Lord, what? He orders your steps, he doesn't order your leaps. And what I'm learning is we want a quick Christianity, we want a quick fix, but God is never in a hurry. He wants to know today, will you walk in love with the people you don't like? It's easy to love people that you love, but it's hard to love people who are unlovable. Why? Because Jesus loved you when other people thought you were unlovable, but Jesus took initiative, and he didn't wait for you to get yourself together. So the question is today, if you want to imitate God, here's the first way. You need to walk in love. Everybody say walk. Walk in love. Now it gets tight in verse 3. We're going to get some shaved ice after this, because verse 3, it gets hot in here. But sexual immorality, it's quiet in this church, and impurity or greed should not even be heard among you as is proper for saints. Now, now Paul, can I teach this? He's talking what? To a church. That word right there, you, is actually plural. So he says there should be no one in the church where anyone can say anything about you dealing with greed or impurity or sexual immorality. He's, he's saying it shouldn't even be a hint in the NIV. Let nobody say that among you. Why? Because when you're doing that, you're not walking in love. Because when you're doing that, you're not imitating God. And he says this. It, it says, as is proper for saints. We're called to be holy. That word holy means to be set apart. There should be some distinction between me and other people who don't claim the name of Jesus. And he says, now, when you're walking in love, there's some areas you need to cut out of your life. There, there's some areas you, you need to get rid of. There, there's some areas that, that you can't do anymore. Why? Because we're supposed to imitate God. Because he's given you new clothes, but we keep putting those old clothes right back on. And it says now that, okay, this is what was going on in Ephesus. The, the problem was they were allowing culture to give the standard on how they were supposed to behave. So Paul is saying, no, stop letting the culture dictate your value. Stop letting the culture tell you how you're supposed to conduct yourselves when it comes to your greed and sexuality. No, the standard is the word of God. And I believe it says in scripture, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So as culture changes, the word of God does not change. And we are going to be a church that preaches the word of God. And I'm not here to make anybody comfortable. I am here to let every single person know, no, all of us are called to be holy. And even if you're not living a lifestyle of holiness right now, that's when we say, God, I need your mercy. I need your grace. But we have to live according to the standards that God gives in his word. Now, this is good teaching. I know people don't like this. Uh, but, but we're called to be 
holy. And then he says in verse 4, obscene and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but, but rather giving thanks. Can, can I talk about myself for a minute? Sometimes we laugh at things we probably shouldn't be laughing at. Maybe we watch comedy or, or, or certain people that make jokes that maybe we shouldn't even hear. The question we need to ask ourselves, why do we still desire it? Why do we still want it? Paul is saying, man, man, that's not the way you're supposed to live. You're supposed to walk in love. You're supposed to walk in a way where there's a distinction between you and everyone else. And then he says this, for know and recognize this. I need you to recognize this. Look at the text. It says, every sexual, immoral, or impure, or greedy person who's an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Everybody say inheritance. Now, I want to have an inheritance for my children. I want to have a blessing for my children. But they will only receive the inheritance when what? They become mature. God has great things for everybody in this room. But sometimes we wonder, why am I not living the life that, that I see in Scripture? Because you're not mature enough yet. So God says, until you get mature enough yet, you're not going to receive the inheritance that I have for you. That is why there's some people you look at who are obeying the word of God and it seems as though God is blessing and the same thing is for you, but in order to receive it, we have to grow up. Because there's a difference between profession and a difference between practice. That you can profess the name of the Lord, but the question is, do you practice the standards of the word of God? Do you walk in love? In verse 6, Paul says, let no one deceive you. And the problem with being deceived is you don't know when you're deceived. And he says, let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Therefore, do not become their partners. He is not saying that you, you, you can't go out to eat with someone who's an unbeliever. He's just saying when you go out to eat with someone who's an unbeliever, don't go to the club with them. You see how I got quiet right there? Yeah, I'm in your business right now. The Holy Spirit's in your business. Why? He's saying don't associate with people where you're not leading them, but they're leading you. You have to be stronger in the spirit than they are in the flesh. And the problem is you've been in the spirit three years, but they've been in the flesh 40 years. He says you got to walk in love. Don't associate with people that will take you away from your identity, that will take you away from the call that God has on your life. That's why he spent three chapters telling you your identity, but in chapter four, what does he say? Live worthy to the calling that I've given you. And so now he's talking about the practice that we should have as believers. See, Christ was delivered for our sins that we might be delivered from our sins. And if we want to imitate God, he gives us a couple ways, and the first one is we need to walk in love, but the second way to imitate God is we need to walk in the light. We need to walk in the light. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Do you see how he continually says walk? Walk in the children of light. You were once in darkness. In, in the Bible, when you see darkness, it's really speaking about ignorance. It's speaking about without knowledge. Once you didn't have knowledge... But now you are the light in the Lord. You receive revelation. Something that was closed to you, now it's revealed to you. Walk as children of the light. Verse 9. For the fruit of the light consists of goodness, righteousness, and truth, testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Testing what is pleasing to the Lord. So my filter with what I'm watching, what I'm listening to, should be this. Does this right now please the Lord? <laughs> this conversation that I'm having right now, does it please the Lord? This association that I have right now, does it please the Lord? Lord, this attitude that I have right now, does it please the Lord? While I'm laughing at a show, does this please the Lord? Does your lifestyle, does my lifestyle please the Lord? I'm going to be honest with you today. There's sometimes my lifestyle does not please the Lord. And at that moment, I should grieve at the sin over my own life 
and repent and thank the Lord that he was the perfect sacrifice for my sin so I don't have to be in that lifestyle again. And the problem is because sometimes we wonder, is Jesus really enough? <laughs> and that's why he spends time talking about our identity. He's saying, listen, no, 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 Ken, it's not about your performance. You are loved by me. It's not about perfection. You are loved by me. But I want you to imitate me and walk in the light. And he says, don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. Uh, you don't have to wave at me, but if you, one time I was in a hotel, a long time ago, I was in a hotel down in Georgia, I believe, and uh, there was roaches there. I, I didn't know there were roaches, but something hit me in the ankle. I was like, I, I know that touch right there. I turned on the lights. What happened? I exposed them, and what did they do? They started to scatter. See, when the light hits your sin, your sin should start to scatter from you. But when you're in darkness, you get comfortable with the own sin on your own life. But we're supposed to expose the deeds that are in darkness. See, it's so easy to expose somebody else, but have you ever exposed your own sin? And this is what I discovered, that God will expose you in private before he exposes you in public. In other words, when you see someone falling from grace, when you see someone being exposed in public, just know that God has already exposed it to them in private. And we have a decision to make because God sometimes, he'll give you some time to get it together, but if not, God will expose you in front of other people. This week, I had a, a pastor reach out to me, and he said, Ken, I just want to be honest today. I, I, I've done some things that I shouldn't, so I want you to start asking me some questions. And I didn't beat him up. I said, thank the Lord that you exposed it right now. Thank the Lord that you exposed it right now. Because when you confess your sins, what happens in, in front of people? Healing occurs. And we got to be a church. Come on, somebody. We got to be the church where if I got an issue, I'm able to go to somebody and say, this is who I am right now. But if you don't expose it, sooner or later, you will be exposed. That is why we're so big on getting in a group. Why? And every Monday when I'm here and, and another men's group is over there, what are we doing? We're not singing kumbaya. No, no, no. We're exposing our sin and throwing axes. We're doing all those things. Why? Because I got to get this off my chest because I don't want to deceive myself. Is this all right? And it says, for it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret, exposed by the light is made visible. See, the light of the world doesn't have power failures. We got to understand that Jesus is the light of the world and we're supposed to be a light to an area of darkness. And I know some of you, God has blessed you with the job. And I, I, I hear it sometimes and then we get the job, we get mad because everybody crazy in there. No, no, who's going to be the light? <laughs> That's why God sent you there. God always sends us places where there's a problem. He sends us places where there's a problem. And then we're praying to God to remove us, but he's saying, no, I want you to be the light when you show up. Because what? When you imitate God, you walk in love, you walk in light, but here's the third way. You got to walk in wisdom. You got to walk in wisdom. Wisdom means the capacity to understand and to do good. I don't know about you, but I need wisdom in this season. Can I be honest with you? As a pastor, I, I need wisdom in this season. I need to figure out, God, God should, should we go back to church? Should we, should we stay off? God, I don't know what to do. I need wisdom. I don't just need knowledge. I need wisdom. Wisdom tells me what to do specifically in a specific situation. I need wisdom wisdom. But God is so good because God knows when to encourage you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because let me just say this and give my own praise report. I'm going to be honest with you. Two weeks ago, I was a little low in my faith. It doesn't happen too often, but I was a little low. I felt a certain way, right? You spend about a year going back to church, and then all of a sudden, like all these COVID cases, and I'm like, we masked up. We doing temperature check. We doing a book. And it just seemed like people in our church and people in the community around this area and if you watch CNN news, it's like Michigan is the number one hot spot specifically in this area. I'm like, God, for real? I'm a little low. I'm, I'm, I'm down and out. And you understand, last year, September of last year, 
I, I had one of our networks, Sin Network, they said, Ken, we want to put you on a prayer calendar. We want to put you on this prayer calendar because people all over the United States will be praying for you. I didn't think anything of it. I sent my picture in and I said, these are the things you can pray for. And what do you know? It was this today. We have churches praying for us. All last week, I went to the P.O. box, had 15 churches all across the country saying today is the day. I want you to know that we're going to be praying for you and the church. God of all eternity said, Ken, I'm going to put you on the prayer calendar the time that you need it. Sometimes you need people to pray for you when you don't feel like praying for yourself. Pastor, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me sometimes? The church are people who can come and pick people up when you're low. And can I tell you, sometimes we got to get rid of this holy man myth. I need prayer the same way that you need prayer. I need some people to lift my hands up when I don't feel like lifting my hands up. I need some people to call me in the morning and say, Pastor, I'll come pick you up if you don't feel like coming to church. Because everybody else has an option, but I don't. Oh, God. Let me get to the text. Y'all want some shaved ice. Let me get to the text. We got to walk in wisdom. Pay careful attention then to how you walk. Watch this. Not as unwise people, but as wise. So when you're walking, you can be wise or you can be unwise. This relationship I'm about to get in, is it wise or unwise? This business deal that I'm about to make, is it wise or unwise? What I'm listening to, what I'm watching, is it wise or unwise? I'm not talking about sin right now. I'm just talking about is it wise? See, there's some things in my life, it's not even a sin issue, but it's a wisdom issue. Is this taking me to my destiny, or is it taking me to a place I should never be? A wise man knows more than he tells, but a fool often tells more than he knows. So it says, so don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. He's, he's talking to believers. Don't be foolish. Be wise. Listen to me over here. Don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. Ken, don't be foolish. But understand what the Lord's will is, and don't get, here's somebody's favorite verse, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit. Somebody was sleeping online. Wine, okay. Ooh, I love this sermon. Is he going to talk about can you drink or you cannot drink and stuff like that? No, you're so focused on what to drink instead of understanding when you drink from God's cup, he'll fill you with the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying is this. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living. But it says, but be filled by the Spirit. How can I close this thing down? The same way that some of us back in the day, just look right at me right now, you were drunk off wine. And now wine had you moving and talking in a certain way. I didn't mean to say that. Why? Because the liquor overtook you. The liquor started having you say things you didn't want to say. And you were trying to walk the straight and narrow line, but you couldn't because you was drunk off wine. What Paul is saying, the same way you were drunk off wine, is now I want you to be drunk in the Holy Spirit. So you can start saying some things you would never say. So you can start loving some people you would never love. And now when the Holy Spirit is controlling you, God will say in the flesh you would never want to shake that person's hand but the Holy Spirit will compel you to apologize to people who should be apologizing to you. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, come here. This is not written to individuals. He's saying that when the church gets filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not a one-time feeling. Come here, somebody online. You're watching right now. No, no, this is an active verb, which means this is something you have to continually do. Every time you get in the Word of God, what do you do? You're filling yourself with the Holy Spirit. Every time you pray, what are you doing? You're filling yourself with the Holy Spirit. Somebody knows what I'm talking about, right? Because you got saved, you felt good, but has anybody ever felt empty? <laughs> because you can get in your car, and I don't care if you pick your car up from Enterprise and it's full, on a full gas, but as you keep going through life, what's going to happen? Whose responsibility is it to, to fill it up again? Is it enterprise or is it yours? Okay. See, God fills you up, but it's your responsibility continually to be filled. 
And if you keep going through life driving that car and it's not filled, you're going to have an engine check light come on. The engine check light tells you that there is something wrong with the automobile, that if you don't get this thing working, then something's going to happen to this car. So you got to understand there's a spirit engine light that comes on. That when I start having a bad attitude with people, when I stop walking in love with people, when I stop wanting to be the light with people, that's the spiritual engine light that tells me, Ken, there's something going on. And the first way is when I don't want to read my Bible, when I don't want to pray anymore, that engine light will come on. And that means we got to get filled with the Spirit. So for the last week, I, I said, God, man, I got to get filled again. And, and can I just be honest with you today? I'm, I'm all out of time. But one of the things that I love about us coming together, but one of the things that I don't love about us coming together, can I, can I be honest? It's because, and I get it, because the climate we're living in, social distancing and, and mass, I feel like I'm missing that touch. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and so I said, you know what, this is what we're going to do. Uh, May 29th, we're having a worship night. I got some of my favorite worship leaders coming. And I said, all that's going to be is about worshiping the Lord. And my prayer is, God, that you would just fill us up again. And it's not for everybody, because it might get a little ugly. <laughs> But I say, God, use that environment not to hear a sermon, but to fill me up again. And I don't know about you, but if you've been riding on empty, you can't imitate God. You can't walk in love. You can't walk in the light. And you can't walk in wisdom. And Paul, he's, he's writing to this church, and he says, man, I, I want this church to walk in love. I want this church to walk in the light. I want this church to walk in wisdom. But in order to do that, you have to be filled with the Spirit. So the question today is, do you feel filled in the Spirit? If I asked you right now, how's your spiritual tank doing? Would it be on empty, half full, or is it full? And then the next question I would ask you, what are you doing in order to fill your spiritual tank?